Hello, everyone, and welcome to 3D System Acute Stroke Intervention Webinar. My name is Erez Bensvi, and I will be today's webinar moderator. Here with me is also Iris Arel, Andrew Mentor Product Manager. In today's webinar, our guest speaker, Professor Iris Grunwald, will discuss recent studies in the field of acute ischemic stroke, selection of appropriate patient for endovascular intervention, and treatment pathway inner center. We will also demonstrate acute stroke intervention using the Angiomento simulator. And at the end of the webinar, we will answer some of your questions. Couple of thoughts of how to participate. On your right hand side screen, you can see a box where you can type in a question at any time, and we will respond to you during the webinar or via email if time not allowed. We will also ask you some poll questions during the webinar, and we encourage you to respond by clicking on your screen the related answer. A couple of words of 3D system. With more than 30 years of innovation, 3D system is the inventor of 3D printing, and today is the leading provider of printers and a wide range of virtual reality simulators for the purpose of training and education of various disciplines. The company offers coverage for a wide range of healthcare solutions, including 3D prints, procedure planning, simulation, and training programs. Our, our healthcare division is at the forefront of surgical planning and personalized medical solutions for more than two decades, and we have more than 20 employees in Golden, Colorado, Leuven, Belgium, and Tel Aviv, Israel with two FDA-registered manufacturing facilities in, in the U.S. and Europe. In today's webinar, we're going to see the Angiomento Virtual Reality Simulator that we use for hands-on training for endovascular procedures. It has a support for more than 25 different procedures, such as structural heart disease, neural interventions, peripheral artery disease, and also abdominal aortic aneurysm and thoracic aneurysms, that are used for the training of different interventionalists for multiple disciplines such as radiology, neuroradiology, cardiology, vascular surgery, and electrophysiology. Here we reach to our first poll questions regarding speciality. Please take a moment and answer your related speciality. Okay, so we see that most of you are coming from other disciplines. We have 22% of interventional radiologists and 22% of neuro neurology discipline. I'm now honored to present our guest speaker, Professor Aris Grunwald who pioneered interventional stroke treatment in Germany and was the first to perform thrombectomy in Europe. She is now based in Southend University Hospital in the UK. She is the director of, the, of neuroscience and vascular simulation at Anglia Ruskin University and recently has set up interventional stroke service using the Angiometer Suite simulator at the university. Professor, I give, I handle the talk to you. Thank you, Es. Thank you very much my introduction. I'm honored to do this webinar today. Before I start with the talk, I would like to know a little bit more about the audience and about the centers that they worked in. Can we please do a poll and ask how many cases are performed in the hospitals of the audiences per year? Thank you very much. I can see that most of the audience are just starting with endovascular treatment. There are also some very experienced centers amongst us with 100 to 200 cases per year. Um, good. So why endovascular stroke treatment? What has happened? Is there any evidence for endovascular stroke treatment? And yes, there is. 
there have been recent trials, and it's only happened over the last months, that have shown overwhelming evidence that endovascular stroke treatment works. The first trial that was that was published was the Mr. Clean study. And the Mr. Clean study, you will see on the next slide, that there, were, uh, there was an overwhelming evidence for patients that were treated with interventional stroke treatment. If you look at the modified ranking score 0 to 2, you will see that patients in the interventional group had a much better outcome versus the patients in the group below in the control group where only um, where um, you can see the 16 and you can see the um, arrow here. So the outcome was much better in the interventional group. The next study, the ESCAPE study, is a study, next slide, that was mainly done in Canada and also in some other countries. And also the ESCAPE study showed a very big, showed a very big, um, advantage for patients that were treated with endovascular treatment. Next slide, please. Next slide. Wait a bit until the slide appears. <clears throat> so here in the graph, what you see again is the shift analysis showing the outcome of patients with a modified ranking scale 0 to 2 versus those patients in the lower row that were treated with interventional thrombectomy. So we see that there is a massive shift for better outcome in patients treated with endovascular treatment and also there was a tendency that the patients had less, that there were less deaths. This was the same, next slide, when patients were stratified by age. Again, significant benefit. It was also the same when the patients were stratified by sex. By, again, overwhelming benefit. Next slide. And also when the patients were stratified by their NIHSS, by the severity of their stroke. Next slide. Here again, when you look at the patients, random, uh, when they were stratified by time, by the onset, by time to randomization, again, if you look in the first line, those are the patients in the control arm. Those patients had a much worse outcome than those patients that were treated in the interventional group, interestingly, regarding, regardless of the time from onset to randomization. Now, with the Extent IA study, again, we had overwhelming evidence. If we look into the next study, the Weber-Scat study, next slide. In the Weber-Scat study as well, we will see that the patients had a 44% versus 28% modified ranking scale. So again, overwhelming evidence. Looking now, next slide, at the SWIFT prime study. 60% versus 35%, massive superiority of endovascular treatment. If we look at 24 hour, um, at, at reperfusion of more than 90% at 24 hours, 83% versus 40%. And if we now look at the sub-analysis of patients with a clot length of more than 8 millimeters, then we have 71 versus 43%. So again, looking at the shift analysis here, you can see in color coded, you can see that there is, again, a massive benefit for patients to have a better outcome, modified rankings 0, 1, and 2, when treated with endovascular therapy. Next slide. So is there evidence? Yes, there is evidence. Over the last month, there's now level 1A evidence for endovascular stroke treatment. And that, of course, has a massive implication on how we're going to treat stroke patients with, a, with major vessel occlusion in the future. And for this, hospitals will now have to set up acute stroke pathways. And no matter what hospital you come from and how your hospital is set up, whether um, you can do endovascular treatment or whether you have to transfer patients, you will always be facing the six steps of acute stroke treatment. Next slide. Those six steps in the acute stroke pathway 
consist of the pre-hospital phase and patient evaluation. So you need to know the history of the patient, whether the patient is eligible for thrombolysis or not. You have imaging and diagnosis. You need to distinguish whether the patient has had a bleed or uh, the typical stroke mimic or whether there's a stroke. Then the primary treatment, that of IV RTPA, and then advanced treatment, endovascular stroke treatment, and afterwards supporting treatment. So let's go through those steps. Step one, pre-hospital care. Next slide, please. First thing is the recognition of the stroke systems, symptoms by the ambulance team, and then the appropriate dispatchment to the right center. Advanced notification of the stroke team buys us time. So if the ambulance team already informs the stroke team that a stroke is on the way, everyone can get prepared. The next step will then be the patient evaluation. Patient evaluation consists of the clinical examination of the patient, also to see if there are stroke mimics, for the laboratory values, and getting the medical history. You would not want to give thrombolysis in a patient that has just had a major abdominal surgery. Laboratory values, how can we get them? Next slide. The next, the laboratory values can be gotten directly at the site where the patient is examined. Next slide. You can see here uh, point of care laboratory and the group around Professor Fassbender was able to show that using a point of care lab directly at the CT scanner halved door to decision times. What is the next step? Imaging. We cannot do any treatment without having an image of the patient. We need to see whether it's a bleed that has caused the symptoms or whether there is an occluded vessel. So patient triage happens at the scanner, which means that all the necessary people, all the people who will be involved in the decision, should be at the scanner to save time. Now, let me ask the audience, what kind of imaging do you currently use in your center? So most of the audience are using CT and CT angiography. 25% of patients are 25% uh, of the audience are using MRI as a first imaging method. So in our center, we are using CT, CT angio, and CT perfusion. Um, we started off with using MR as the first imaging modality, um, but we have moved towards CT. We do use MR in wake-up strokes or in the posterior circulation. Now. Primary treatment, the, um, let's go to the next step. <clears throat> that is that of IV thrombolysis, but then already of the preparation of the patient for the cath lab procedure. Urinary catheter, you'll often have patients moving if they do not have a urinary catheter, um, and you have to decide whether or not the patient will need intubation for the, for the um, thrombectomy. Next slide. You will see here a caricature of a patient lying there for the endovascular treatment. Not all patients will be lying as quietly and peacefully here. Often we have to take the decision and we have to change decision with starting um, with conscious sedation in the patient, but then have to convert to using general anesthesia. Now, the next slide shows us that there are so many people involved in this pathway and that the major thing in setting up an interventional stroke service is the team training. We have involved in our team anesthetists, um, stroke physicians, neurologists, um, we have the cath lab staff inside uh, in the team, so it's a whole group of people who are conventionally not used to working with each other. Next slide. And that is why for team training, we have a setup at um, my university, at Anglia Ruskin University, where we um, have 
a high-end simulator with which we can simulate not only the complex procedure, but we can simulate in the center the whole pathway, including anesthesia, um, uh, and the whole pathway of the patient management. As you can see at the top of the slides, there's video cameras on the top which can monitor it, so a different team could watch the first team perform, because in the end it's all about time and everyone knowing what they have to do from the moment the patient enters the hospital and the decision is taken to when the patient is in the cath lab and when the procedure is started. Next slide. So our nurses and our whole staff go for repetitive training sessions, um, not only in the field of stroke, but also just about complications, just how to deal with complications and um, carotid stenting, aneurysm coiling. Um, you do not want to find out um, or you do not want to practice a complication when it's happened. You want to do this in a safe and in a controlled environment and that is what we're doing with our team. Next session, next uh, step, the post-acute care. Rehabilitation should start as soon as possible. Um, we need to look for causes and for the risk factors of the stroke. Every fourth stroke is caused by a stenosis of the carotid artery. And the further medical management needs to be planned. Next slide. And in those cases where a big stroke does develop, patients need to be sent for decom decompressive surgery, and that pathway also needs to be arranged. I'm now going to show a video of how we have incorporated simulation training into our stroke pathway. So on the left hand side of the video you see the simulated environment whereas on the right is the real life experience. So what we have is um, we have the patient who's had a stroke and the patient is now um, in the hospital and the moment the patient, we know that the patient is coming, the team is informed. Note that the members of the team include both the stroke team and men, uh, several members of the stroke team as well as the interventional neuroradiologist. The patient is then brought to the CT scanner where CT and CTA is performed. Often we also perform CT perfusion. And here the occluded vessel was found and immediately the anesthetist and the cath lab team are being informed and the cath lab is prepared and the patient is brought to the cath lab where the interventional procedure can be started. On the left hand side you see the simulator where there's a simulated occlusion of the middle cerebral artery. Um, also medications are now given on the simulator. Um, on the left hand side and you can see the occluded vessel, in this case it's an occlusion of the middle cerebral artery and here now thrombectomy is being performed using a stent reaver device. And the final one shows reopening of the vessel and the clot that is captured in the device. The neurologic control of the patient shows that arm movement is restored as well as leg movement and if we are fast enough and if we manage to coordinate a very fast pathway, this is an outcome that um, patients should be able to receive if instant recognition can be achieved. Now, coming back to the six steps of the acute stroke treatment. Every hospital has to decide what is their best way for achieving the fastest pathway for selecting patients for the triage, for, decision, for the decision whether or not that patient should be treated with endovascular therapy. And wherever you can shorten the pathway um, <clears throat> is a success. So in most cases, it will mean bypassing accident and emergency and the team meeting directly at the CT scanner. The team being the stroke physician neurologist as well as the radiologist or interventionist who can take the decision on treating the patient in the cath lab. Not everyone has the setup, next slide, of a mobile stroke unit, 
a mobile for mobile stroke unit, of course. This gives the opportunity of combining all these steps in the van. And I'm showing here the inventor of the concept of the mobile stroke unit, Professor Klaus Fassbender from the University of the Saarland. And he was able to show that by running a mobile stroke unit, an ambulance on wheels that is equipped with a point of care lab and a CT scanner and all the expertise, that he was able um, to shorten stroke onset to decision times from 60% and was able to treat 60% of patients within the golden hour versus 4% only in an optimized hospital pathway. Coming to patient selection, how do we do patient selection at our hospital? So we have several selection criteria. Next slide. One is the clinical selection. And we would select patients with an NIHSS of 10 or above if the patient is aphasic. And this automatically would trigger a bleep to the interventionist as well as the anesthesiologist and the cath lab. Now coming to the imaging selection criteria. Next slide. So conventionally, the aspect score is being used. We would use an aspect, or like in the SWIFT prime study there, the aspect score was six and above. In the ESCAPE study, it was above five. Um, the aspect score has also been run on the penumbra pivotal stroke trial. And what it showed was that patients with a low aspect score of zero to four have a very low chance of a good outcome whereas patients with a high aspect score, which is the green graph on the left, have a big chance of having a good outcome. So next slide. Let me remind us what is the aspect score. The aspect score is, uh, is when the brain, the middle cerebral artery territory, is divided into 10 regions, and 10 would be a normal scan, and uh, the moment there's damage in one region, the score is decreased by one, and the lower the score, the, lesser, the um, less chance does the patient have of having a good outcome. Now, in our uh, center in South End on Sea, what we're doing, next slide, is we are using an automated method um, of the aspect score where the where the score, where it's all done by a software, and the score is shown already up here. You can see this patient had an aspect score of eight. The damage that is displayed is in two areas. Um, and in addition, you can do windowing of, um, of the CT scan to get the best stroke window. Um, so from the imaging selection point of view, next slide, we would choose patients with an aspect score of six and above and with a major vessel occlusion. Now, what happens if we're not in the hospital, if we're on the go? Next slide. On the go, we are transferring images directly from the CT scanner to our iPad. And with this, even if we're somewhere else in the hospital or not directly there, the whole stroke team will get alert that there's an acute case and will get notified. Next slide. So I've put the pathway here. So basically, the pathway um, consists that if the ambulance people, uh, if the ambulance team suspects that there is a stroke, then um, the stroke team and as well as A and E are called. If the NHSS is 10 or above, or if the patient is aphasic, um, the patient, um, the interventional radiologist will also be informed. And if there's a major vessel occlusion of the patient and the E aspect score is six or above, that will trigger the pathway for the interventional treatment with notification of the um, anesthesiologist of the cath lab. Um, and the, it will then be decided whether or not the patient is intubated for the procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. Now we will turn to see the acute stroke intervention using the Angiomento simulator. Professor, would you, um, would you comment on what we see right now? Yes, I will. I haven't seen this case yet, but I'll be interested to see. Yes. In the middle of the screen, I can see the heart, high blood pressure, 185. We would not lower the blood pressure, so we're actually quite happy if a patient has a high blood pressure, and we would um, <clears throat> keep it that way. And especially if we need to intubate a patient, um, we would pay um, special attention that the blood pressure um, is not lowered. 
I can see a catheter there. It looks like a, um, a vertebral catheter. Um, during the procedure, um, I presume one would be taking um, a balloon guide, so this would have to be a long vertebral catheter of 125 centimeters. Um, we could see it being pulled back and falling into the, I guess, left common carotid artery. Now drugs are being administered, 5,000 units of heparin. Yes, we would do the same. There now a, a sheath is being pushed up. I presume that this is we would use an 8 French balloon guide for the procedure. The angle is being adapted and a one was taken. There's no stenosis of the carotid artery. Very important to um, have a look at that first. If no CT angio exists, to double check that there's no underlying stenosis. Um, the wire was now pushed into the internal carotid artery, followed by the um, catheter, very smooth um, pushing up of the balloon guide, if it's a balloon guide, um, of the guide catheter, very nice, which is now placed two centimeters above the bifurcation. The angle is now being adapted and um, the field of view um, is put towards the intracranial view. We will now need an injection, which is just being done, and the occlusion is shown, which is an occlusion of the left internal carotid artery. Magnification, yes, because we need to get a better view of what is happening. Important, very important to never get lose the catheter out of sight. Um, a road map here. Uh, for the working position, we would want to see the end of the um, guide catheter in it, and I can see here now, yes, a balloon guide was chosen, and now the next um, uh, thing that is being pushed up is a microwire, a 14 microwire, is <coughs> being used with a microcatheter, I couldn't see which microcatheter that was, and they are being pushed through the clot. The microwire should be advanced a little bit further, um, but um, we now have positioning of the microcatheter. The microcatheter is being pushed up. It should always be pushed up via a microwire. Um, and the idea is to put the microcatheter through the clot so that in the next step a um, thrombectomy device could be um, used. Um, now, an injection was done via the microcatheter. Um, <clears throat> um, this is, uh, some interventionists do this, some don't. It's debatable because um, you could dislodge a clot distally. On the other hand, it gives you a very good um, uh, overview over how long the clot is. As we can see here, we would now know exactly how long the clot is and which vessels are being occluded. Um, what was done now is that a I think a stent retriever was, um, so the microwire was taken out of the microcatheter, a stent retriever is being pushed up inside the microcatheter. You can see here the guide, the balloon guide um, in the internal carotid artery. The um, next step will be the positioning of the stent retriever and this is now being released you can see the um, proximal marker of the stent retriever, and now um, the notification comes up according to the IFU to wait for five minutes, um, the idea being that the stent will expand and, um, and uh, go into the clot. We will now have to see whether, um, whether the markers, whether the uh, distal marker of the microcatheter will be pushed over the proximal marker of the stent, which is, is very nicely done, and the um, stent retriever is now being pulled back out of the vessel under aspiration. We can see that the balloon guide is expanded, so this whole procedure was done under aspiration. Um, in the left-hand corner, I could see the, um, uh, the syringe being adapted to the TUI borst. We can still see that the catheter is, um, that the balloon is um, inflated. Uh, this is done to um, prevent, um, prevent any, uh, losing any emboli. 
So a balloon has now been deflated. The question is now, was the vessel open? We can see the vessel is not quite open, but it's um, already a success. So a part of the clot was removed, but what remains now is occlusion um, of the M1 segment. The whole A1 territory is open again. And um, the interventionist here is now um, choosing uh, another 14 microcatheter, also chose the um, angle of the tip of the catheter and um, is trying to navigate the way again into the occlusion to pass the occlusion. Interesting feature, the possibility um, to uh, change the um, angle of the tip of the microwire here, beautifully put up. Now this time um, the microwire always led the way. So it's now in the right position. The wire has been taken out. The microcatheter is now in place. The next step will be to um, choose the um, stent retriever. Again, a distal series would, was done. I probably wouldn't have done it this time um, because we already knew the length of um, the clot, but um, it doesn't. Uh, it's uh, an operator's choice. So now the stent is being released. Again, excellent um, release with the clot being um, in the middle of the stent retriever. Um, the aspiration is started. Very important part to not forget the aspiration. I think this is, um, this is um, vital in clot extraction. And the microcatheter beautifully pushed over the uh, proximal part of the stent retriever and the stent retriever retrieved, balloon deflated, control run now shows complete opening of the vessel in both planes. And in this series, I also didn't see any occlusion of some distal M2 branches, but not all were in the picture. Yes. Thank you very much, Professor Wundberg, for the fascinating talk. This webinar is recorded and will be soon be online, so you will be able to see this demonstration online and see what the simulation was all about. For those of you who um, might have some questions regarding what type of complications and treatment are supported um, in this simulator, so, Professor Grunwald, would you like to share your experience with it? Um, yes, so these, um, <clears throat> there's a variety of complications that are incorporated. What I like about the simulator is that um, although you also have the possibility to trigger complications, and I can trigger those if one of my um, trainees is in the middle of a procedure, the simulator will also um, react to any mistakes that the trainee does. So, if you manhandle the vessel, you will cause a complication. You can cause a perforation of an aneurysm. If you forget, uh, you can have thrombus formation, you can have dissection, you can have vasospasm, and you will then have to deal with these. I um, particularly like the complication features because that is um, what makes all the difference, knowing how to deal with complications um, in an emergency. And I want my team to have experienced and seen um, possible complications that can occur and be able to deal with them in a stress-free environment before having to do it in a real case. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, this is the time that um, we will answer some of the questions that raised during this demonstration and webinar. We will answer three of your questions and the rest we will email you after the webinar is over. And here is the first question from one of our audience. What are the advantages of using the simulator over other training methods? Professor. For me, question? Okay. Right. Um, so, well, that's a, that's a complex answer. So, um, we have been training physicians for many years in different models, be it in, um, in, in glass models, silicon models, or on animal models. Um, 
I do not think that any of these models give you a realistic overview over the anatomy. Ideally, what I would want is I would want to have trained um, procedures on a real life anatomy. It's not the, the, the challenging part is not being able to pull out the clot, it's getting to the clot. And for that, the anatomy um, plays the most part. So doing a procedure in a pig is not the challenging anatomy that you have to reach. So I want to have difficult aortic arches, especially in stroke patients will, be, um, will usually be el um, elder patients. Um, the they have tortuous anatomy. Um, I will want to have, have people being able to get an 8 French catheter safely into the common carotid and um, nowadays, because um, so, so many procedures are being done with CT imaging as with CT angio, um, we are not doing that many diagnostic procedures anymore. So that skill set is, is lost. So basically, our interventionists today have to start with the tricky procedures themselves rather than diagnostic angios. And um, I think the unique advantage of the simulators is that you can replicate real anat anatomy and if I wanted even a real case and put the real case on the simulator um, and practice on that case every single step of the procedure. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Another questions we have for you would be, do you always use a balloon catheter? Yes, a balloon guide. I would, um, I definitely believe um, that you will get better. Um, Recanalization re um, results getting a balloon guide. This has been shown also in several animal models and um, um, the group around Professor René Chapeau also did uh, several hundred patient studies showing that you have better recanalization rates um, using a balloon guide. I definitely believe um, that this is the case. Um, in the, the only exception would be in the vertebral artery but in the carotid artery um, I would in most cases prefer to use a balloon guide um, for the procedure, yes. Okay, and we reach our final question. What do you think is the role of simulation training in stroke treatment? I think we are now faced with the challenge of having level 1A evidence for interventional stroke treatment but not having enough trained interventionists. And that also includes interventional neuroradiologists. So in any other procedure, I can make an appointment in a center and they would have scheduled two free cases or a case and I could go and, um, and watch the procedure and learn by that. With a stroke, this is not the case. I could schedule an appointment with a center and for the next three days there is no stroke case that comes in and when the case finally comes, it happens during the night. So I think the, um, the role of simulation training will become um, more and more important and I do not think how it will be possible to train the huge newly arisen demand for interventionists without doing those procedures on a simulator. And um, I must say that the simulation now is so realistic, it's advanced so much from being an expensive toy to being a real um, procedure and a real um, uh, tool that can give you the same haptic feedback as you would experience in a patient. So th I think the future lies in vascular simulation and I think that um, in the very near future patients will not be asking their interventions or their operator anymore how many cases have you done, but they will be asking how many cases, how many times did you practice my case on the simulator. Okay, thank you very much. So this is the time that um, to conclude the webinar. Once again, thank you Professor Grunwald for your interesting and fascinating talk and thank you all for joining us today. We apologize if we haven't answered all of your questions due to time limitation, but be sure that we will, rep we will reply you via email to the address that you have provided us. If you have missed this webinar or one of your colleagues could not attend the session, we, have an, we invite you to our next webinar with Dr. Thomas Masaryk on July 14th, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Daytime from the Cleveland Clinic. And I remind you all that this webinar was recorded and will be soon be available online. I appreciate, we appreciate that you take a moment to 
fill a feedback form on the webinar and if you have any questions feel free to contact us at the address shown below on the screen. Once again, I thank you all for the participation in this webinar and wish you a great day. Thank you very much. Thank you.